Welcome, you're watching The Real Medvite, and first of all, it's been a while since I've really made this kind of like a classic PowerPoint, high quality video, but we're back once again, and it's been a, and it's also been a while since I've done a History of Christian Theology video. This is going to be, I believe, the eighth installment, uh, and it's going to be on icons. So in this video, we're going to be covering uh, the theology of icons uh in in christian history and what we're going to emphasize we're not going to be talking about the historical aspect we're not going to focus too much on that outside of the basics but we're going to be talking about the theology right because if you wanted the historical account you already have a bunch of nerds dealing with that stuff what we're going to be dealing here is the theology of icons does it make sense what's the logic behind it why do we even care about icons so much right and uh, and so let's begin. Yeah. So what, what we're going to be covering in this video is going to be a multitude of different things. Um, first of all, we're going to be covering what the iconoclast controversy is and what it isn't, right? So some misconceptions are going to be tackled, uh, kind of a, a short historical account. Then we're going to be looking at, uh, the theology of both sides, right? The presuppositions of both sides and, uh, what they're, what their position in detail is, both the iconoclast and the iconophile. And then we're going to be kind of closing this with a couple of extra questions that might be relevant today. So some of these will be related to maybe Eucharistic adoration. Some of these will be related to stature. Do you use statues? Uh, why? Why not? And uh, depictions of the Father, right? Do we depict, the, do we depict, depict God the Father? Uh, in what manner does icons work? All of these questions will be answered. So if you're a, you know, if you're Orthodox that just wants to know more, if you're Roman Catholic that's just wondering, you know, what is it with icons that these Orthodox they they just love these icons so much? Why do they like them so much? Um, and even if you're Protestant, if you want to understand, like, what is the best argument for icons and Orthodox can give to me? Is you want if you want if you're any of these people, this video is for you, right? Uh, we're going to be looking into this historical position that the Orthodox Church today still to this day holds. So let's let's start uh, with what the iconoclastic controversy is. It's a crisis that occurred in two different stages. So it's not just one thing that it happened for a couple of years and then it died out. It's it it happened, it died out, and then it happened again, and then it died out again. That's how it, how you can basically classify it. The first stage uh, was between the years 726 and 787. 787, that uh, stage one was closed, was marked with the uh, Seventh Ecumenical Council, the Council of uh, the Second Council of Nicaea, and then stage two uh, kick started in 814 and ended with 843, with the local synod of Constantinople 843. So uh, in both stages, the iconophiles historically have won. The iconophile position was uh, vindicated in the church, and it was the accepted view. And this whole controversy really can be said to be closed with the synodicon of orthodoxy that we still preserve and sing and we declare in, in the Orthodox Church today. It is said in the Divine Liturgy every first Sunday of Lent with its anatomas, that it's everything, All right? So still to this day, this kind of victory, you can say, uh, lives on. Now let's look at what the iconoclast controversy is not. Uh, first of all, it's not a explosion of two existing factions that have always existed. Uh, the uh, the pro-icon side always existed, and I'm going to show you, this video is basically going to prove you why, but... Even both sides, even the iconoclasts at the time understood that their position was kind of was kind of new. A lot of them understood this. Some of them didn't, some of them did, but uh they kind of understood that their position was new and they they looked at the church fathers and what they write about icons and most of the time they found, oh, you know, uh actually we have nothing to go by. And um and this, this aspect can be surprising for a lot of people, but not all iconoclasts were for rejecting images. Um, so the iconoclast position is a lot more nuanced than how it's historically shown. 
People think if you're an iconoclast, you're just some guy. Oh, I would just want to destroy every single image. No, there is there are degrees of how you viewed images. Sometimes you some iconoclasts, for example, they didn't have any problems viewing images as useful. Um, and I will definitely say that at that time, that was kind of like the consensus is that both sides understood that images were pretty useful. Um, so, for example, if if an iconoclast walked into a church and the church had a couple of icons but or, or a couple of images, you can say, but no one venerated them. They weren't significant in the liturgy. They were just optional and, you know, they were like mosaics and it was just took too much effort to like take them down. All of these considered, I kind of class walks to the church like that. He looks at them. He won't have any problem with that, for example. What he will have a problem with at the end of the day is if these icons have a kind of like a liturgical context, if they're used in the liturgy, if people venerate it, right? If there's a lot of them and they're kind of this indispensable part of the church. If they saw that and if they saw a church viewing the icons in such a light, that is when the problem arises. And of course, what I'm saying, I'm I'm pretty much simplifying. We're going to get into the details later on in this video. But that should give you an idea of how they view these things. So um, not every not every iconoclast was anti. There were obviously iconoclasts that were completely against icons in all senses. I'm not saying there weren't. What I am saying is that I will say amongst the more smart iconoclasts, which is a, you know, uh, which is, which you know are two words that don't really mesh up together. But among the smart iconoclasts, a lot of them admitted no icons, images, they're not inherently bad per se. But there's other problems with it. That's what they will usually say. So I just wanted to kind of give you an idea if this debate is kind of no more nuanced than it seems like, right? And um, and before I move on, I want to say that uh, I forgot to mention. I should have said this in the beginning, but this video is going to be based on Father Ambrosius Eucalyptus. Uh, this is the book, uh, Images of the Divine, the Theolo Theology of Icons at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. This video, this proper presentation is going to be based on this book. So if you want to, not everything is going to be, uh, not everything in the book is going to be covered here. But if you're, if you're, for example, interested in what, on, in this content, you can get that book for yourself. You can find it online, probably. Um, forgot to mention that. And one of the one of the big um, claims that Father Ambrosius makes is that ultimately this debate is about essence energies distinction and uh, and Christology also. So really key uh, issues were debated in the iconoclast controversy. And I do think that he makes a very good point that again we're going to be looking at uh, later on in this video. So just keep all of this in mind. And Let's shortly look at um, kind of like the historical arguments of iconoclasts for now. So um, there was an article made by, I believe, a reformed Protestant called uh, something, something unicornist, something. I don't know. But it's, it's by John Parker. And his point was to show, he tried to show from the church fathers, from the early church, that icons were not main place in the Orthodox church. Or like icons were kind of this innovation. It didn't exist in the early church. And his point was to try to prove that until the Seventh Council. Uh, there's a really good response to it by Craig Trulia responding to John Parker's Anikonist argument. I'll be linking that article in the description below. And uh, John Parker's mainstay argument is pretty much St. Epiphanius. He points out from St. Epiphanius that St. Epiphanius has several right anti-icon writings. Uh, now, the Seventh Ecumenical Council considers these writings as forged, but um, Craig points out that if you actually read his other letters, something interesting pops up. Uh, Saint Epiphanius, if he wrote them, right, admits that his position is in the minority, which means that he's, he basically admits that his anti-icon views was the minority view of the church. So this is from the letter to Theodosius. Uh, Nicophor, Saint Nicophorus writes, First of all, Epiphanius confessed that laughter and mockery spread throughout the assembly uh, because of his uh, sayings. And then Saint Epiphanius adds, I have often advised those who are reputed to be wise. So bishops, concelebrants, right? 
bishops that are in the same communion and fathers of the church to take down those things, those things being icons. Not everyone paid attention to me, actually only a few. Um, and then St. Epiphanius writes, moreover, um, who has ever heard of this? Meaning, in this context, you know, who has ever heard of this kind of has this meaning of, oh, you know, no one has ever heard of this kind of thing. But in this context, he's actually saying, you know, you guys have heard of this, right? You know what I'm talking about. Who has ever heard of uh, painting an image of Christ in a church and whatever? So it's, it's basically kind of affirming this was a historical position. And... Um, and it goes to show you. He he later on says, if it possible to if it is possible to remove these things, that will be very good. Meaning the icons. If on the other hand it is impossible to remove holy images, people shall be happy with the mosaics that have already been put up, but not to make any more. Right. In fact, our fathers drew nothing other than the sign of Christ across on walls and that everywhere. So that's allegedly what he says. And I just kind of wants to point out if you want to read the historical kind of refutation of anti-icon arguments um, that some Protestants will do. Check out Craig Trulia's article. It's pretty good. Let's look at the historical perspective of the Orthodox in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Um, both sides kind of understood that icons were historically used. Um, so the job was not on the Orthodox to prove icons. The job was for the iconoclasts to prove uh, their arguments. You know, how can they make it make sense, right? Because they're kind of going against, in their perspective, at the very, at most three century old tradition, at least, uh, sorry, at least three, uh, a tradition that is three centuries old. But what's also interesting that I want to point out is that the Seventh Ecumenical Council blames Jews and Muslims for reintroducing iconoclasm in its current form. Next slide is going to be dealing with that. And, uh, and another thing to note is that the papacy was consistent in their defense of icons for kind of a long time until the Carolingian theologians uh, started to oppose the Seventh Ecumenical Council and went as far as to say that the Seventh Ecumenical Council is the reason why the Byzantine Empire is not doing so well. That's They went as far as that. Um, so, for example, the papacy opposed Emperor Leo III's iconoclasm, but the emperor uh, responded by taxing the Pope and taking away uh, bishops from his jurisdiction. So this is from the book, uh, from Father Ambrosius's book, uh, according to the narration of John of Jerusalem, and this was read in the second session of the Seventh Council, a Jewish magus called Tessara Contapekis Conta, Conta promised the Caliph Yazid II a 31-year reign if you are the destruction of the icons in his realm. Yazid complied, and they started to kind of start that but uh four years later i think uh oh he died prematurely before he even started doing this right With, and and the quote here is without most people having heard of his satanic decree so before this decree even came to be yazid the second died the icons were restored and yazid's son valid uh ordered the false prophets to be put to death and theophanes insists that leo the third inherited his baneful doctrine from yazid and uh so a lot of the Orthodox bishops at the time basically claimed that this was like this Jewish-Muslim collaboration to kind of subvert the Orthodox faith. And I think that's just something interesting that I wanted to point out. Um, and in this, it is said that Pope Gregory, blah, blah, blah. Pope Gregory II in letters to Leo III protested vigorously against Leo's iconoclasm. His, success, his successor, Gregory III, called the Council in 731, which anathematized those who destroyed or blasphemed the sacred icons. So you can see this, the papacy, like even before the ecumenical council, made a position saying, no, icons are to be defended. Images are to be defended. And uh, Leo, taking his revenge on the Pope, imposed burdensome new taxes on Calabria and Sicily, and he removed those ter these territories from his jurisdiction, along with Illyria, which was under the Roman jurisdiction, and assigned them to the jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Constantinople. So the emperor didn't even like it. He went, to, he went as far as to basically take away the Pope's jurisdictions and give them to, to, the, to the Patriarch of Constantinople. Um, and uh, how did this... Council gets received over time. Well, St. Photius uh, eventually in an encyclical letter uh, and at the General Council of Constantinople 867 
insisted that the Council of 787 was ecumenical, uh, strictly ecumenical, and also this was the judgment of uh, the 14th Synod of 879, which some of us, which I, for example, call it the Eight Ecumenical Council. If you've seen my, if you've seen my collaboration stream with Ubi Petrus, I mentioned this council and uh, as well. And in this page, this is long, so I'm not going to read everything, but you can pause the video and read this page. The basic idea is that after the uh, seventh council, uh, partially because of uh, translation issues, uh, Frankish theology rejected uh, the decisions of the council in 794, but over time, like even a even hundred years later, uh, even a hundred years later, by 871, uh, and like moreover at to at the time, the the West started to see the East as heterodox. It even said it they even said some such things that uh, Greeks have ceased to be emperors of of the Romans for their cacodoxy. So basically, uh, the Roman Empire is the is the papacy. It's not the it's not the Byzantine Empire anymore in their view because of this council. And um, and yeah, so. For a very long time, the West actually, after the Seventh Ecumenical Council, rejected the Council, which, even though the, it, it, which this is part of the you know Roman Catholic historical tradition. I mean, it's undoubtedly part of the uh, Roman Catholic historic tradition. And the kind of point that I'm trying to get at is that this will explain why in the Roman Catholic Church even today, the Seventh Ecumenical Council is kind of like this decorative decorative tree, tree that doesn't really matter that much. Not many people know what was at stake, what was being dealt with. They just think, oh, it's that council where images are okay. Well, it's not just that they're okay. There's a lot more into that council that is being messed up. So, uh, enough about the introductions. Now let's get into the meat of this argument. So I'm going to be uh, pointing a couple of iconoclast arguments, and then I'm going to be showing you uh, iconophile responses to those iconoclastic arguments. So, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is scriptural arguments that iconoclasts use. Some of these arguments are very classic. Um, some of the you heard of these before. So, for example, Exodus twenty uh, four and uh, Deuteronomy five eight. Uh, one of one of God's uh, commandments saying, "You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth." Uh, John twenty twenty nine. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So basically, this kind of gives you the idea uh, that for iconoclasts, uh, they think scripture blatantly opposed the idea of making images and worshipping or bowing down to anything that contains the likeness of anything in heaven. They argued that this was an explicit rejection of that. They made further arguments from the New Testament Um the, the base of the argument is that icons depict what is seen for our visual pleasure, but scripture is against this idea. It considers this idea as inferior. So John 1.18, no one has ever seen God. John 4.24, God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. John 5.37, his voice you have heard, his form you have never seen. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.16, even though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. 2 Corinthians 5.7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Romans 10, 17, therefore faith comes by hearing and hearing by the work of God. And uh, and, and finally, uh, iconoclasts think that iconophiles, when they have icons, uh, they implicitly take away God's glory uh, from God and implant it into images. And because of that, they are idolatrous. So St. Paul says in Romans 1, 23, 25, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Uh, so you get the kind of idea, the, the kind of scriptural arguments that they're going for. Icons are inferior. They're not to be used. You can't find it in the scriptures. You can find it some places in tradition. So this is kind of like the first a wave of attack that the iconoclasts use against iconophiles. And these arguments, you know, Protestants use these arguments as well, many of them, they go straight to Exodus 20. Um, but let's look at what iconophiles respond with. So obviously iconophiles are going to look at those verses and they have to say, well, I do accept what the verse says, 
but uh, they have to kind of bring some justification from our side. Have have icons been used? The iconophiles say actually, uh, icons are not just a church father tradition. It is from scripture, and I'm talking about the Old Testament. So they argued from not from the New Testament, but from the Old Testament. Uh, Genesis 28:18. For Jacob raised a cell to God as a result of which he blessed him and promised him gifts beyond those he had covenanted. Five chapters after Exodus 20, uh, God says in Exodus 25, 18 to 22, And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work, and you shall set them on either side of the seat of mercy between the two cherubim that are on the ark. So, uh, Numbers 789 also talks about the 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 two cherubim, and he heard the voice of the Lord speaking to him from above the mercy seat that is upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. Uh, Ezekiel 41 uh, says, And he brought me to the temple, and on all the walls round about in the inner room and in the outer room were carved cherubim and palms, a palm tree between cherub and cherub. Every cherub had two faces, the face of a man towards the palm tree on the one side and the face of a lion toward the palm tree on the other side. The whole of the temple was carved round about from the floor to the ceiling to cherubim and the palm trees were carved on the wall. Um, and this kind of reminds me, um, I was in, in the voice in the Orthodox Christian Discord a couple of weeks ago, I think. And we were talking about icons and some people were like asking questions about icons. And then this jackass Protestant comes in. I'm not saying he's a jackass because he's a Protestant. He's, he's just a jackass. It's a complete jackass just comes butts in halfway in, says we're basically worshipping graven images, acting sarcastic. And he basically cites Exodus 20, right? He basically says, God tells us not to use current images. And I, and I point out, okay, but the same God in the same book, five chapters later, orders the Israelites to make images. So if images are bad, then why did God tell Israelites to make images? And he said, "Oh well, that's uh, that's because, uh, you know, he 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 starts arguing. Oh well, one of God's commandments is that thou shall not kill, which it is. It's thou shall not murder. There's a distinction there, but whatever. He said, oh, he says thou shall not kill, but God ordered Israelites to kill people. Uh, God allowed Israelites to commit sin because they were not like some really stupid reason like that. Basically." It, he, logically speaking, what he was basically saying is that uh, God contradicted himself. He gave commandments that he himself does not approve. He basically gave commandments that actually go against his own commandments, which obviously does not make any sense. It's so stupid, but that's the response he gave. Obviously not logical, right? So we don't put these verses into tension with each other. But I just remember that. That was a very stupid argument. Um the, the, the point that iconophiles were also making uh, is that the works made by human hands are not for the glorification of human hands, but rather for the purpose of glorifying God. So uh, what they were pointing out, out is that in the iconoclastic view, you should not glorify or venerate the works of human hands. And they will point out, well, I mean, a lot of things are made by human hands that are glorified. So, for example, Seventh Ecumenical Council quotes Exodus 31. Uh, in the Seventh Ecumenical Council says, God says to Moses, cut tables of stone and bring them to me. And having cut them, he brought them. And God wrote with his own finger the ten life-giving and immortal commandments. Then God says, you shall make tribute and you shall make an altar and you shall make an ark and put your testimony in the ark as a memorial to your descendants. That is, the tables, the jar, the rod, are these forms and likenesses, what uh, likenesses made by human hands or not, but they are for the glory and service of God. So, Another point is, what are our churches if not made by human hands, right? The churches are holy places, they're important places. Even Protestants will agree. They're made by human hands, so should we not consider churches important or should we? are they just any other building? Well, for American, a lot of commercialized American Protestants, they will say, yeah, it's just a building, well, who cares? <laughs> uh, but the Seventh-day Communical Council moreover says, uh, quoting Numbers 21 and in 1 Kings 6.23, For if we believe that the Israelite people were saved through looking at the brown serpent, far be it from us to doubt the Holy Fathers or to depart from their tradition. King Solomon made cherubim to the glory of God in a temple which he built for God and decorated with various colors. Therefore we too and all the Orthodox confess our faith and beautify the house of God with various colors and the decorative work of painters. So, 
you get the idea. There's a lot of Old Testament basis for icons. It's, it goes back to Old Testament. So to reject icons is to reject the Old Testament. And uh, although the evidence for icons is, again, ultimately found in scriptures, uh, there is still this kind of logical aspect of the arguments where you're supposed to be logically consistent with what you're trying to say. So if you don't act like that dumbass Protestant uh, who says, oh, God contradicted himself. That's the best way I can explain, which <laughs> it's, it's, it's so crazy. Like he really, I, I wish I was like making this person up, but he's an actual, he's an actual person which is the craziest part. But there's there's a logical aspect to this too. There's a logically consistent aspect to this, which showcases that there is no uh, tension between the scholastic logical aspect of Christian theology and the mystical spiritual aspect of Christian theology. They are united. They're distinct, but they're united. They're one and the same uh, thing. We just call them theology, right? Uh so we don't have this kind of like you can say Roman Catholic or even a Protestant view where we distinguish worship from theology from like scholastic logical theology. Really, they're the same. And when I say scholastic, I don't mean Western scholasticism. I'm mean, I'm talking about using philosophy and logic uh, to to explain and to know God. That's what I'm talking about. So uh, that's not bad. That's not evil. And that's an aspect used in iconoclast controversy. So we don't we don't boil it down to this like vague pseudo mysticism of oh ultimately we can't explain it no that's stupid pietism has no place in the church. Icons are also in a way symbols that represent uh, a form of reality right. Icons are symbols and if pictorial symbols are unacceptable, for example because they depict the undepictable, uh, won't that imply that scripture is also unacceptable because what are letters? What is scripture if not you can say a couple of books and what are books if they're not a collection of uh, letters and what are letters if they're not just, you know, what are verse if they're not just a collection of letters. You get the idea. Um, they are also icons. They're also symbols that depict something. Instead of pictorially depicting something, they, in, they depict things in terms of writings. And so if, if icons are unacceptable because we can't depict things, then social scripture be unacceptable. And this is the kind of dilemma that iconoclasts, no matter what religion that utilizes any form of symbolic language to explain God, has to deal with. So Islam, for example, has this problem. Uh, most forms of Judaism, I will say, will have this problem. Protestants will have this problem. Um, and there's, I think, no way they can explain away, away from this. I mean, again, scripture... Holy books are also in a way icons. In fact, they are higher forms of icons, but they're still nevertheless icons. And uh, for example, St. Cyril says, For faith depicts the Logos, who being in the form of God has also been brought to God as the redemption of our life, since he has slipped into our likeness and become man. Um, the parables fulfill for us the function of icons by putting forward the efficacy of what they mean as if it were accessible to sight and to touch, as well as even of those things that may that may be contemplated invisibly in subtle conceptions. Uh, so according to this view, the icons which are used by the faithful are nothing but sacred books in coarser script. So sacred books are higher forms of icons, but they're still both, as I said before, icons at the end of the day. It's, a it's just a finer iconography. St. John Damascene summarized all the representational advantages in a single sentence. The icons are books for the uneducated, heralds that never fall silent but teach beholders with mute voice and sanctify their sight. Um, so in a way, he's basically saying icons are in the form of scripture. And think of the, the time period at that time where uh, a lot of people didn't know how to read, right? So how will they know about the Christian faith? Well, not by scripture if they don't know how to read. And they, you might say, oh, they just listen to someone who reads them as if, yeah, as if everyone has that luxury. I mean, give me a break. We're talking about we're talking about the fourth, fifth centuries here. Not everyone had that luxury, but they had the luxury of divine images, right? Of images that they could see. They could see those images. See, oh, this is talking about this one biblical story, and this is talking about that other biblical story. And this happened in, uh, and this was written by this prophet. This was written by this apostle. So it has an immense value. Even today, I will say an immense uh, pedagogical value.
So, uh, the iconophiles understood that the iconoclasts are ultimately logically, if they were logically consistent, ultimately in their position, they seem to be rejecting any form of symbols, which in their logic, they will have to re reject scripture. And, uh, and moving on with patristic arguments. So we're going to be looking at, again, first, patristic arguments against the icons. There are two main patristic arguments. And, as, and if you have two characters as, as patristic arguments for something, that's kind of like a weak argument uh, for something as major as iconoclasm. And the main uh, one, of, one of the people that the iconoclast cited was Eusebius of Kayseri. Now, he, he was an Arian or at most an Arianizer. So they already just said, yeah, who cares what he thinks? But then uh, there's St. Epiphanius of Cyprus, uh, which we talked about before, right? Uh, but as I said before, uh, if St. Epiphanius really did write those things, those anti-icon writings, the same St. Epiphanius admits he's in the minority. So it actually refutes the iconoclast argument from uh, the Church Fathers. Now, let's look at the patristic argument for icons. So we look at St. Athanasius, St. Vasil, St. Epiphanius of Cyprus, uh, St. Isidore of Pelusium, they all make the point that venerating an icon is venerating the person that the icon depicts. Uh, and so the type and the prototype, that is the depiction and the thing being depicted, have a connection with each other. So for example, when we venerate the image of an emperor, we venerate the emperor, not the image. When there is an emperor next to his image, we don't say there are two emperors, we say there's only one emperor. So let's, for example, look at St. Athanasius. He says, therefore, he who venerates the icon venerates the emperor represented in it. St. Basil says, for the icon of the emperor is also called emperor, but there are not two emperors. Right? For the honor rendered to the icon passes over to the product. So the honor given to the image of the emperor passes over to the emperor himself. And likewise, vice versa, if you dishonor the image of an emperor, you're dishonoring the emperor himself. So logically speaking, if you're dishonoring an icon of Christ, you're dishonoring Christ himself. If you're dishonoring, for example, scriptures, you're dishonoring the Christian faith. And St. Isidore of Pelusium uh, says there is no mention of a temple which is not crowned by a statue. Now, the term statue in here means something that is exalted. So it doesn't, just, it doesn't mean uh, just like something... Like, you know, a statue, right? But it can also mean an icon. It could also mean anything material that's decorative, you can say, kind of. Um, I don't like the, calling icons decorative because it's much, much, much more than just something decorative. But you get the idea. St. Anastasius of Antioch then talks about the relationship between depiction and the thing being depicted. He says, when the emperor is absent, his icon is venerated in the place of his person. But when he is present, it is absurd to aban abandon the prototype in order to venerate the image. When it is not venerated because of the presence of him on whose account its veneration takes place, however, it shall by no means be dishonored. When someone insults the icon of the emperor, he receives a just punishment, exactly as if he had dishonored the emperor himself. Similarly, if someone dishonors the type of a person, the insult is conveyed to the person himself of whom it is the type. More patristic argument for icons. Uh, there are saints that pretty much explicitly or implicitly accept icons. So St. Cyril of Alexandria's letter to Akakius, he says, If any of us desire to see the story of Abraham, the sacrifice of Isaac, painted on a panel, or how will the painter draw it? Then he kind of goes on to, to more. But he basically implicit, implicitly accepts that this is a thing. St. Nilius to Eparch Olympiodorus uh, talks about how the churches are adorned. He says, In the sanctuary on the east wall of the divine precinct, mark only a single cross. By the hand of an excellent painter, fill the nave of the saints on every side with narrative scenes from the Old and New Testaments. So the entrance of the church has narrative... Uh, uh, no, no, so never mind. But uh, so in the church... Uh, you have a bunch of narrative scenes from the Old and the New Testaments that are, are depicted. For those that are illiterate and cannot read the sacred scriptures, might truly looking at the pictures be instructed in the noble deeds of those who are truly served God and might be stirred up to rival their celebrated and famous achievements. Right? St. Jerome of Jerusalem also says, And just as God allowed every nation to venerate things made by human hands and was pleased to let the Jews venerate the tables which Moses had hewn and the two golden cherubim, so too he granted to us Christians to paint and venerate the cross and the icons of noble deeds and to manifest our work. 
Uh, Seventh Ecumenical Council cites numerous historical events of icons being present in antiquity that uh, has some kind of like a healing power, you can say. Eusebius of Kayseri, who is an anti-icon, who's anti-icon, talks about the story of the woman with the hemorrhage, of whom it is related by various historians that she set up a statue of the Lord. So the woman with the hemorrhage in the scriptures set up a statue of the Lord and of herself, touching in accordance with the gospel narrative, the fringe of his statue, just as she was when the healing took place. Um, Eusebius of Kaiseri also points out that when Christ appeared in Jerusalem, Abgar, who at that time ruled the city of Edessa as its kings, heard of the miracles of Christ and wrote him a letter, and Christ sent to him an answer by his own hand as well as a copy of his holy and glorious face. And you can go, and at his day, you can go and see that picture which was not made by human hands. Crowds of people of the East gathered there and prayed. So he points out that this is an icon made by Christ himself, not made by human hands, that you can look at today. Uh, anonymous scolding presented by Antipater of Bosch from the 1st, 5th century. Uh, he says, Such a divinely inspired erection of a statue shall rather be considered to pertain to the Mosaic law, even though grace and truth are better than types and preferable to the shadows, points out to the existence of icons. The Queen of Sex Council in Canon 82 uh, basically, implicitly, pretty much accepts icons. Canon 82 is, TLDR is basically, don't draw Christ as a lamb, is basically, that's the canon. Uh, and this is also, by the way, the Seven Technical Council used this canon and accepts the Queen of Sex Council wholesale, right? So the entire Queen of Sex Council is dogmatic. Um, is also important thing to point out. Saint John of Thessalonica against the Greeks, uh, and the Greeks being the pagans, the Greek pagans, he says, and this is a detailed account of how we use icons, he says, we make icons of mortal men, and he distinguishes his view from the pagan view, uh, of mortal men, of the holy and embodied servants of God, in order to commemorate them and honor them, and we do nothing unreasonable in painting them as they were in life, for we do not express ourselves through art as you do, nor do we show bodily characteristics of incorporeal beings. And when we venerate them, we do not venerate the icons, as you yourself have said, but we glorify the personages represented pictorially, and then not as gods, God forbid, but as true servants and friends of God who have the ability to intercede for us. We also make icons of God, I mean of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but we paint him as he was seen on earth and lived amongst men. Not as he is conceived of, it, of in his nature as God, for what likeness or what form is there of the incorporeal and formless logos of the Father? For God is script, spirits, as scripture says, that is to say the holy nature of the consubstantial trinity is spirit. But since God the Father willed it and his only begotten divine logos came down from heaven and was made incarnate for our salvation by the Holy Spirit and the spotless virgin Theotokos, Mary, we depict his humanity, not his incorporeal divinity. So this should give you an idea of how the Orthodox view icons and the qualifications. And uh, uh, St. Stephen of Bostra uh, basically talks of, uses, cites the Old Testament and um, he also goes into detail. Uh, I'll, I'll read this as well, although it's a bit long. So give me a break. I've got to get a water break. I'll be back <laughs> in five seconds. Oh. Man. It just feels so good drinking when I'm, I've been talking for like 30 minutes. Um, but he po but he basically uh, kind of makes the same arguments. Uh, he says, What is there on earth that is venerated which was not made by human hands? Was the ark of God not made by human hands? What of the sanctuary and the mercy seat and the cherubim and the golden jar which contained the man in the inner tent and everything that was called by God, holy of holies, were not the cherubim, the icons of angels made by human hands? What do you say? If you call these things idols, what do you say to their veneration by Moses and Israel? Veneration is a symbol of honor. When we sinners venerate, we glorify God with divine worship and worthy veneration and fear him as our maker and provider, but we glorify the angels and servants of God in accordance with the honor of God as creatures of God and his servants. For an icon is a name and a likeness of the person represented in it. So, uh, we can summarize kind of the other uh, common iconoclastic con confusions. A lot of them confuse veneration with worship. They consider these things the same. They can they fail to distinguish these things. Um, 
there's a debate on what an icon is. So this is kind of like an unasked question, which I think is important in this debate. For an iconoclast, what does an icon even mean? Um, for for a lot of iconoclasts, they will say matter is evil. Some others will say, well, it's not evil, but it's fallen. Therefore, it cannot be, you know, good, kind of. Uh, it cannot be associated with anything divine. Uh, and saints in Christ cannot be depicted because after their death, after their death, they become intelligible and undepictable beings. So they return to being intelligibles. And this is just textbook originistic uh, vomit. And in general, we see this confusion, uh, confusing uh, key terms such as essence, energy, nature, and person. Uh, so if you're in the know, if you know what these means, you know what I'm talking about. They, they confuse all of these things together. So St. John of Damascus, in, in distinctions in worship, uh, says that veneration is a symbol of submission and honor, and we know different forms of this, so different forms of veneration. The first form of veneration is the form of worship which we offer to God, alone by nature worthy of veneration. Then there is the veneration offered on account of God, who is naturally venerated to his friends and servants, as, G as Joshua the son of Navi and Daniel venerated the angel, or to the places of God, as David said, let us venerate in the place where his feet stood, or to think sacred to him, as Israel venerated the tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem standing in a circle around it, and then from everywhere bowing in veneration towards it, as they still do now, or to those rulers who had been ordained by him, as Jacob venerated Esau, made by God the elder-born brother of Pharaoh, appointed by God his ruler, and his brothers venerated Joseph. And I know that such veneration is offered to others as a mark of honor, as Abraham venerated the sons of Emor, either therefore reject all veneration, or accept all of these forms with its proper reason and manner. So again, St. John Damascus the, this says that the distinction between veneration and worship, again, is in the Old Testament. Right? This distinction is, again, present in the Old Testament. And you have, you're starting to notice a couple of things. A lot of arguments for icons, first of all, scriptural, but it's from the New Old Testament. Um, so it's from the Old Testament period. And we don't reject that. Right? We're not Marcionites. We don't pit Old and the New Testaments together. Um, on the question of if matter is evil, uh, iconophiles will present their, their problems with th this view. They will say, if matter is evil, then matter is either uncreated, uh, which goes against Genesis because Genesis says matter is created, or Scripture lied when it says, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Basically, the point is, everything that God creates is good, if matter is evil, then it's not created by God. If it's not created by God, it has to be, well, the only person that can create anything is God. So it has to be uncreated, right? That's the that's the kind of logic behind it. If it's uncreated, then, you know, matter has to be eternal. And then you have this, then this logically leads to a Freemasonic, uh, you can even say Hellenic view of God as the great architect instead of the great creator. Uh, instead of, the creator ex nihilo, right? Uh, if matter is evil, or rather it is fallen, which means that it's unable to bring about spiritual grace to us, then that will that will mean we'd have to consider scripture, we'd have to consider baptism in the cross. Uh, are, is scripture fallen? So do we say that the scripture is fallen? Is baptism fallen? Is it is baptism evil as well? Is baptism unable to be a conduit of grace? Is scripture unable to be a conduit of grace? I mean, ask any Protestant. Do you think scripture is unable to be this conduit of God's grace to you? And they'll say, no, shot. Like, they I, they can't accept that, right? Um, or any anyone that believes in baptismal regeneration, Catholics, right? I mean, is baptism or like even, you know, like baptism obviously can't be evil, right? But it's also material. Uh, and finally, if matter is evil, then how did God, who is goodness, become incarnate as man? Right? It was a basic dilemma. So St. John of Damascus, in this, in this long quote, I'm not going to read it, but uh, uh, talks about the deification of matter. And he talks about, uh, he says that he honors all matter and venerates it. Uh, True matter, filled as it were with a divine power and grace, my salvation has come to me. For example, was the three times happy and blessed wood of the cross not matter? 
Or is the sacred and holy mountain of Calvary not matter? What if the life-giving rock, the holy tomb, the source of our resurrection, was it not matter, right? Um, so all a lot of things that has given us, you can say salvation has given us um, God's divine grace. They're material, right? It's it's true matter that this has been given to us in a lot of ways. And that's kind of what he's what his point is. So if if you reject icons because they're made of matter, and matter is has to be evil, it doesn't make any sense with Christianity at all. Uh, and iconoclasts on on making distinctions, as I as I said before. So for iconoclasts. Uh, all true images are to be taken nat to be natural or consubstantial with their archetype. So if something is an image of something else, if X is an image of Y, X and Y has to be consubstantial with each other. They have to have the same essence. Uh, from this derives the utter impossibility of distinguishing between natural and imitative icons. Now they're all the same thing. And by further consequence, image and archetype or prototype are also identified uh, to be the same thing, really. Consequently, Christ and an icon of Christ must be identified in their essence. That is to say, icon and person represented must always be consubstantial. Uh, since only natural icons exist, an icon in general is identified with archetype. Every attempt at the iconic representation of Christ treats his two natures as identical. Another problem, another implication is that this means that icons, depictions of, for example, Christ... Uh, would imply in this view that the icon itself, the wood, the created wood, has to be consubstantial with Christ. So you're basically giving, in this view, divine characteristics to the wood, which is idolatry, a right? textbook idolatry. Also in this view, which is, this is originistic, that the that sanctification of any created being is considered as spiritual, spiritualistic dematerialization. And so ultimately, and at the same time, ultimately, because of this consubstantial iconic view, the only true icon for, for uh, that is like, sound, that the only true icon, material icon for the iconoclast is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is an icon of Christ. The Eucharist is consubstantial with Christ. And you can also see, because of this view, this kind of necessity for what is known today as the Latin transubstantiation view. And before you say Council of Jerusalem 1672, uh, don't make the word constant fallacy just because the translation says transubstantiation and the Greek term resembles that doesn't mean that they use the same exact concepts. Let's not be uh, less lesser than uh, preschoolers, please. Okay, let's have a brain. Just because you use the same term doesn't mean you're talking about the same concept. You that it's your it's on you to prove that it's the same concept and. Most of the time, the people that try to do that, they have not proved anything. And these are the same people who like look at the confession of Dusty Taste and they're like, look at this, Orthodox believe in purgatory. No, that's, you're stupid if you believe that. But you get the point. Iconoclasts will say that the Eucharist is an icon of Christ. In in response, the iconophiles will distinguish between all of these categories. Real, real distinctions uh, were fundamental, right? The first was a distinction between nature or essence and hypostasis from which flows the distinction between kinds of iconic representation. And this was, you know, this was crucial for Trinity and Christological controversies. And, uh, and there was also a distinction between a natural icon and a hypostatic one. So, for example, the, the natural icon is consubstantial with its archetype. So, for example, the Son of God is a natural icon of His Father, both with regard to God and with regard to men. Right? And the second excludes this eventuality with the result that on the one hand, the icon is an imitation of an archetype, while on the other, it belongs totally as icon to the hypostasis of the subject represented. So imitating, right? It basically represents someone symbolically. Uh, on to the Christological aspect, and the iconoclast controversy is, in, in a lot of ways, a Christological controversy. Uh, and the iconoclast problem really, which in its essence, is a monophysitic argument. I'm not going to say the iconoclasts are exactly like the Orientals, uh, because Copts, for example, have the tradition of icons, but the argument is kind of borrowed from Mon Monophysite. So this argument goes something, like they will explain it kind of like this. Okay, Christ is one person out of two natures, right? And uh, you will accept that the divine nature is incomprehensible. It cannot be depicted, but the human nature can be depicted. Uh 
But if you depict only his human nature, not his divine, then you're separating the two natures. That is basically the argument. So iconophiles are Nestorians, is what iconoclasts will say. So this is the kind of argument that they will go for. The Council of Hearing in 754 basically affirms that. Uh, and the iconophile response is that, first of all, there's a distinction between, again, nature and person, essence and hypostasis, right? Uh, so what is depicted is not the natures. Natures are not something that you can read. The natures can be depicted only in the context of the person. So it's the hypostasis, uh, Jesus Christ himself, that is being depicted. And there's also a common sense response that really doesn't take that much brain power to figure out. If someone saw Christ in the flesh, is he dividing Christ's two natures? Because he can't visibly... I mean, the divine nature is unseen. It's invisible. The human nature is seen. So by looking at Christ, aren't we also dividing his natures in that view? It, it's, to, it's totally stupid. Like, this is a very stupid argument. <laughs> you just think about it for five seconds. It makes no sense. Uh, then, every, then the apostles were separating Christ's two natures then because they were looking at Christ. It doesn't make any sense. Um... Christ, who is God, was incarnate as man, uh, deifying matter, uh, which includes the matter used to represent him, which includes the matter he took on himself. Uh, because he's now fully human, he can now be depicted. So he took, takes on a new mode of being, an additional mode of being, an additional new characteristics. And one of these kind of, you can say, characteristics is the ability to be depicted, right? You can say that, for example. He is now able to be depicted because he has now become matter like us without losing his imma immateriality, of course. And the two natures are only separate in, in, uh, in according to mind. They're not separated in reality. So uh, what we concretely witness is one hypostasis conceptually distinguished into two natures. And when we say conceptually distinguished, this is still a real distinction. It's still a actual distinction of the two natures. <clears throat> And uh, both sides basically understood this as a as a Christological debate. The Robert Council of Hieria in 754 basically says what a true icon is, and they point out that the Eucharist is really the only true icon of Christ. Um, so for iconoclasts, the only true icon of Christ is the Eucharist, while the body and blood of Christ really is Christ, in our view, we will say. So... Um, so we don't. So we say it's not an icon, whereas iconoclasts will say it is an icon. And the implication of that, first of all, is that there's no distinction between icon and archetype. The the if 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 the Eucharist is an icon, then the Eucharist, in if we are to like logically follow how we view what an icon is, then we will have to say the Eucharist is something else, right? Uh, but in their view, what is being depicted, and the thing be, thing that it is depicting uh, are basically the same thing. So it's really not, so it's a really stupid view of what an icon is. And uh, the kind of dilemma is again, is let me, let me rephrase it more simply. Uh, if the, the Eucharist is the real presence of Christ, if, if I'm, I'm talking from the iconoclast pr perspective, it has to be the real presence, but the Eucharist is also an icon of Christ. If it, it and it's also Christ. So there's a, so the icon archetype, they're basically then the same thing. And Christ is an icon. The, the word of God is an icon of the Father, right? But doesn't that imply that they also have to be the same thing? Well, of course it does, right? And if you distinguish the persons in the Trinity, then you also have to distinguish uh, the Eucharist from Christ. But that means Christ is one thing, the Eucharist is another. Then now the Eucharist is not Christ then who are we eating, right? Who are we eating then, if not Christ? So the iconoclastic view on the Eucharist is just really stupid. It doesn't make any sense. Whereas in your Orthodox view, we make these crucial distinctions that prevents us from falling into these errors. Uh, and Joseph Farrell in God is Dialectic, page 264 says, Thus the crux of the iconoclast argument is this, an authentic image had to be identical in essence with what with that which it is portrayed. Hence the emphasis on the Eucharistic real presence throughout the controversy, as well as on the biblical expression that our Lord is the express image of the Father. Um, and this is why they taught that or the Orthodox were idolatrous. 
And uh, you can also see this kind of need for a Latin form of transubstantiation doctrine to make to have to make this have make any sense. But the Eucharist, as Father Ambrosius points out, is not an icon. It is not an icon. Uh, it is Christ Himself. So, uh, no, sorry, uh, stupid people, saying the Eucharist is Christ is not Lutheranism, right? Which doesn't even make sense as an argument, but. Uh, Father Ambrosius writes, a further distinction is made between the icon of Christ and the bread of the Eucharist. The bread of the Eucharist after sanctification, although the bearer of uncreated energies, is neither a natural, nor an imitated, nor an analogical icon. So it's not an icon at all. If it were an icon, it could not be the body of Christ. Right? It's really simple. Uh, so all these people that... I, I've been... I'm not joking. From supposedly Orthodox people, which really... To be honest, they're not even properly Orthodox. From supposedly Orthodox people, they called me Lutheran for saying this. I call, I got called a Lutheran for saying the Eucharist is not an icon. I mean, if it's an icon, then who is in the Eucharist? This is a really simple, basic question. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out. Like even if, if I told this to a seven-year-old, I can guarantee you he will understand that. He will understand what I'm saying. The tenth time, he will understand. He was like, okay, I... Okay, sir, I get your point. But these people, I, I guess they're like, I mean, I guess I was going to say, you know, it seems obvious that you don't have anything up your noggin. So uh, maybe you should go buy a brain from the supermarket or anything. But honestly, these people, their souls are so messed up and dirty and filthy that an average brain can't even help them. It's Their, their soul is just too filthy that makes them think a lot of these stupid stuff. So they have to cleanse their soul to even kind of grasp what is being talked about is what I think, I, I, ultimately, for, for some of these people. It's insane. It's crazy. Uh, Father Ambrosius more, moreover talks about, uh, he says, for the iconophiles, the insistence on the incarnation, the fundamental fact of Christianity from which all else springs, inevitably involves even its depiction in icons. For iconography constitutes the essential mode in which faith in the incarnation is confessed. True adoration and worship of the true God is performed scrupulously through fidelity to our holy confession of faith about Him and true keeping the integral and more carnal mysteries and laws given by Him. So, um, the, the the centrality of the Orthodox faith and unity is the the sameness of the holy confession of faith, right? Um, Father Ambrosius points out uh that we should remember that the Orthodox tradition does not honor the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist with special acts of worship. Right? This is another point I made that got me called a Lutheran. Surprise, surprise. So, I guess I guess the the, the holy fathers of the seven ecumenical councils were council were Lutherans because they didn't believe in Eucharistic adoration. Now they adored the Eucharist, obviously, but they didn't believe in Eucharistic adoration, uh, right? Like the Western Christian tradition does with the service of bened benediction. Moreover, not even the icon of Christ is adored as divine in itself by the iconophiles. So if you're going to make the argument, for example, oh, the sacred heart is an icon of Christ's love. That's why worship, no, 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 that doesn't work. You can't worship an icon, period. An icon is not to be worshipped. Unless it's a natural icon that is consubstantial with God, Christ, right? We worship Christ and he's an icon of God the Father. But if you're talking about uh, a non-consubstantial icon, then we can't. We can't worship an icon. We therefore do not call the icon itself God, but we know God who is depicted in the icon, whose name the icon bears. So uh, this is going to take some time. I hope I can read properly, but these couple of pages are very, very important, kind of give you a very good idea of the theology of icons. And I want to kind of, we're approaching the end, I want to close it <clears throat> with this. Father Ambrosio says, <clears throat> It is not only the saints, therefore, who by grace participate in the natural holiness of God. As already indicated, the icons of the saints also participate in divine holiness by virtue of the hypostatic identity which they maintain with their prototype. <clears throat> they can thus communicate holiness to their venerator and make them partakers of it, since through them you can ascend to the prototype and participate in holiness. Thus the iconophiles say, Behold the high icons of the saints which, with burning zeal and faith, calling to mind their piety, and while venerating, they invoke the God of the saints, saying, Blessed art thou, the God of, of this saint and of all saints, who gave them patience, 
and made them worthy of thy rule. Make us partakers of them and save us by their prayers. This perception of the participation of icons in the uncreated, purifying, sanctifying energy of God is so intense that the Seventh Ecumenical Council can urge, Let us therefore make ourselves worthy of veneration, lest in approaching unworthily we bring our, on ourselves the punishment of Uzzah, for when he put his hand to the ark, he perished immediately, since he had approached it unworthily. And indeed the ark too was decorated with various designs and was constructed of wood just like the icons. The iconophile honor and veneration of icons may be summarized as follows. The uncreated God imparts himself to his creatures in his uncreated glory or energies. Only the saints and the angels participate in the deifying energies of God. The sanctifying, purifying and illuminating energies uh, are also participated in, the, in through the icon of every saint by virtue of the icon's hypostatic identity with his prototype. So there's a relationship between the icon and the person that the icon is representing. And because of that hypostatic identity relationship, uh, the divine grace of God is, you can say, transferred to us through that, through icons. Uh, Veneration with the with the icon, with the vehicle of these divine energies, communicates the latter to the venerator himself in proportion to his spiritual state. This schematic rendering also works in the opposite dis direction as follows. Denial of the possibility of participation in divine energies by means of the veneration of icons of the saints may very well mean the rejection of the church's drug doctrine of deification of the saints. The denial then of the veneration of icons indicates a denial of the possibility of the true and actual existence of the saints that is, of the possibility of the sanctification and deification of human nature. The denial, however, of such a possibility implies the denial of the divine economy. Furthermore, the denial of the possibility that through his energies God may be participated in by his creatures leads to a complete overthrow of Christianity and to out-and-out -out atheism. Whatever is true of the icons with respect to the participation in the divine energies is equally true of the relics of the saints. We also kiss their venerable relics in order to participate in their holiness, proclaims the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And the Council strongly supports this thesis. Demons are often driven away by use of the relics of martyrs. Tell me how many overshadowings, how many exudations, and often flows of blood too have come from the icons and relics of martyrs. If it is impious to venerate the bones, how is it that the bones of Joseph were carried from Egypt with the greatest veneration in Genesis 50, 25 and Exodus 13, 19. How did a dead man revive when he touched the bones of Elisha in 2 Kings uh, 13, 21? If God works miracles through bones, it is obvious that he can do so through icons and stones and many other things. The pious devotion of the iconophiles does indeed reach out to many other things related to the holy places and wonderful events of sacred history. All of us believers venerate the cross as the staff of Christ, the holy sepulchre as his throne and bed, the manger in Bethlehem and the rest of his holy dwelling places as his house. We venerate Zion as his set city. We salute Nazareth as, as his hometown. We embrace the Jordan as his divine bath. For wherever he walked or sat or appeared or touched or cast his shadow, that place we venerate and respect in our fervent and ineffable love for him as the place of God. In doing so, we venerate neither the place, nor the house, nor the town, nor the city, nor the stones, but him who went about in them, and appeared in them, and was recognized in the flesh in them, and delivered us from the seat in them, namely Christ or God. The iconophiles are also fond of invoking St. Gregory the theologian, who in his homily on the nativity of Christ exhorts the faithful with the words, Respect Bethlehem and venerate the crib. Despite this, the true worship of God in spirit is not offered by the iconophiles through the veneration of icons, relics, holy places, and sacred objects, but through the correct confession of faith and life in Him. For the true worship and veneration of the true God is accomplished with exactitude in the observance of the holy confession of faith in Him and in the keeping of the most essential capital mysteries and laws given by Him. Therefore, the people of Christ have to this day assigned neither the name that is above every name, nor divine reverence nor worship to anyone except the holy and life-giving Trinity. Just as the God whom we worship is one, and faith in Him is one, and saving baptism is one, so too the worship offered to Him by us is one, as has been handed down by the holy apostles and safeguarded the sacrifice of praise which the divine apostle said is offered through Christ to God the Father that is the fruit of lips that not acknowledge His name. And the sacred, sacred tradition handed down through the life-giving mysteries, which, is, which the prophet Malachi foretold, 
when he said, speaking in the person of God, that from the rising of the sun to its setting my name is glorified among the nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name and a pure offering, since we know for certain that there is no hope of salvation for us from any other source than from a devout confession and faith in the one true one in the, in the only true God who is venerated in the Trinity. <clears throat> so to kind of recollect the grace of the depicted person, whether it is God himself or a saint, transfers God's divine grace on, onto the icon itself and ultimately the believer who venerates it. And there are several implications. For example, icons are holy things or holy images. Uh, and so they should not be used in any derogatory manner. It, to do so is sacrilegious and I will even say blasphemy. This will, for example, I will say includes making an icon as your profile picture while you spout heterodox stuff. All right, that's a very good example. I've consistently noticed that icon profile pictures are some of the most pre lest disgusting people I have ever seen in my life. It's very consistently. All of them are like very, very bad people. Not all of them, but a lot of them, I'll say. Most of them. A few of them are misguided. Maybe they have bad ideas, but most of them really bad people. Um, and they're committing sacrilege, I think, uh, by kind of commercializing and, and disrespecting icons. It is only holy people that can be venerated and considered graceful. This is why icons are not to be treated as some form of quirky art, but it is something, it's a tool, it's, an, it's a tool owned by the institution of the church, which means that these nonsensical anime icons or the or supposed icons of degenerate pop figures that you see on online so much and people make them all the time, it's utter blasphemy. It's disgusting form of blasphemy. It's a mock, they're mocking God himself. And if they don't repent, I'm very sorry. Uh, if, you, if you don't repent, bye-bye. That's all I can say. Goodbye. People don't like the, I guess people don't like the fire and brimstone approach, but you know what? Screw it. I am a fire and brimstone guy. If you do stuff like this and you haven't repented, I don't know if any of those kinds of people are even going to watch this video, but if you do that kind of stuff and you don't repent, I'm very serious. There's no way you're getting into heaven. There's no way you're going to any place other than hell. Like I'm, I'm hundred percent, a thousand percent certain that you're just whoop going in there because of that inherent disgusting disrespect. Um, it's, it's the truth. Okay. It's the truth. I mean, how can you, but again, if you, if you ask forgiveness, if you repent, then obviously not only God, but the Christian believers, you yourself, everyone will forget about it as if it never even happened in the first place. But that's a different topic. Repentance is a different topic, but you get the idea that I'm getting at. They should repent. If you do this kind of stuff, if you make icons a toy or some commercial to be used, whether you're orthodox or heterodox, I'm the, the only good friend will tell you this. Someone who's, who's afraid of his image is not going to say that you're going to go to hell because he's going to be afraid of hurting your feelings. I, I am going to hurt your feelings because I don't, I'll be honest, I don't give a shit about your feelings. If you feel bad or good, I don't care. That's, that's up to you. But as a true friend, I will tell you, if you don't repent, you are going to hell. That's, it's unfortunate, but you're disrespecting God. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. So they're not your plating and don't use them as your plating. Take them seriously. The conferment of honor, however, upon very good creatures does not necessarily also signify the veneration of all creatures in general but only of those which participate in the purifying, illuminating, and deifying energies of the Holy Trinity, right? So, uh, again, we don't make icons of just any other people. So you have you see people making these George Floyd icons or like, like Dr. Fauci icons. They make those people. Oh, those people are, oh, bro, you are not going to go to a nice place. All of these people, look at those people and pray for them that they repent and find a true gospel because literally only God, your prayers and their willingness to repent can save them. Nothing else. Those people are, they're, they are, they're more, if, if you ask me, for example, if you gave me one person who is uh, like 80 years old and he has COVID and another person who has Dr. Fauci icon profile picture, 
I'm gonna tell you this straight. That COVID, that COVID patient, he seems pretty secure. He seems pretty secure and settled. I think he'll live a 10, 10 more years. The other guy, I can't say the same. He seems to be already very, very dead. Spiritually speaking, he seems very, very dead. So now let's get to the extra uh, questions as we end this video. Uh, the first kind of common question that you might get is statuary, right? Some people might ask, are statues acceptable? Why do Orthodox not use statues? Roman Catholics use statues. Is there anything wrong with them? Um, the church makes, makes a distinction between secular representational art and sacred icons. So these are two different things. So the iconoclasts attacked iconophiles and claimed that, that the iconophiles were introducing secular art into the church and the iconophiles responded by saying, no, this is a concept, a lawful institution and a tradition of the Catholic church. It's not a secular representational art. Uh, so uh, when it comes to statuary, uh, it's a very dodgy debate. I think, I personally think statues are unacceptable because of that. Because statues are, they're secular art. They're, re they're secular for art. They're not something that is owned by church or by the church. They're, they're secular art. And, be and because of that, I don't think we can accept statues. The Seventh Ecumenical Council doesn't really make any comments on statues, but... Uh, we have to also understand the Seventh Ecumenical Council isn't just accepting any like re representational image, right? They're not just saying, "Oh, you know, paintbrush, the, the paint with a like a uh, paintbrush or something." That's also cool. I mean, obviously, they, they, they didn't exist back then, but you you get what I'm talking about. They didn't accept all forms of representational art can be used in the church, but rather uh, things that the church owns, so mosaics, right, icons, these things. Uh, uh, is kind of, and you see here in this page this kind of emphasis on on icons as a sacred tradition that the church owns. So I personally think I personally think I will stray away from such. I do know that there are some I believe Orthodox monasteries and maybe even churches that have statues. Some places in Russia, I'm not. That's why I'm kind of like you know it to me. It's not a big deal. Like if if I if I saw a Roman Catholic, I won't re attack him because he has statues. I will say, I will say, where, where are your icons? Um, I will attack them for having statues. I will basically question where are your icons because I look well. Yeah, that's not really much of an icon. I'm talking about like an icon, like these babies, right? Where are those? Um, so. Another another question is, uh, can we depict the Father, right? Can we depict God the Father? Uh, the Seventh Ecumenical uh, Council explicitly uh, is against depictions of the Father. St. John Damascus, for example, says, if we made an icon of the invisible God, we will have sinned. For it is impossible that which is incorporeal, formless, invisible, and uncircumcised to be represented pictorially, right? So, when, when the scripture says depicting of anything in likeness in heaven, this is what it's kind of referring to, depicting what we don't know, depicting what we cannot know. And uh, the I, and uh, I believe this is St. Theodore, of St the, the student says, Therefore, if iconic representation had existed before the incarnation of the Logos, it will not only have been base, but most absurd for the non-incarnate Logos to be localized in the flesh. Right? So for the iconophiles, faithful to reality as God desired it and created it, do not claim to represent that which exists in general, but only truths which are circumscribed and possess dimensions and are immediately relevant to man's salvation in Christ. Accordingly, they refuse to represent the first person of the Holy Trinity, the Father, since he totally transcends every sensory experience. Why do we not describe and paint the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because we do not know who he is, and it is impossible for the nature of God to be described and painted. Now, I want to make a very strong footnote in this because I used to, I used to be like go, I used to go all out about this, like no depiction of the fire. But I will say, I do think that there is one exception. That exception is the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is the Father is considered both Christ and the and God the Father as the Ancient of Days, right? So, both of them are treated as Ancient of Days from Daniel Daniel seven. The Son of Man is Christ Himself, right? So Christ is the Ancient of Days because of his, Him being an icon of the Father. But nevertheless, the point that I'm getting to is that 
the scripture talks about the Ancient of Days, and the Father say the Ancient of Days is the Father. So to me, it seems like it's logically consistent to say outside of that context, we can't depict God the Father, which I most of the icons of the Father you will see uh, that depict him, most of them are in the context of Ancient of Days. So... I will say with that in bearing bear that in mind when you look at you can say canonical icons of the father I think those are not inherently unacceptable because if scripture can talk about God the father as ancient of days why can't icons kind of just makes sense right uh, so there's that kind of like a qualification that I think is very crucial and that marks the end of this video so um and uh it's to summarize, the iconoclast controversy is a genuine debate on what an icon is and how in what mode can matter be considered sanctified or, or venerated. What are, what are these distinctions and whatnot? Uh, the iconophiles accuse iconoclasts of Gnostic and various other heretical presuppositions. And as we've seen in this video, they were mostly correct, if not all correct. Uh, monophysitic Christology paid the way for iconoclast Christological arguments. And one has to wonder, uh, what, like, for example, a lot of people say, well, outside of uh, Christology, we all have the same fate, as some people say. And you have to wonder, like, first of all, we don't have the same doctrine on the wills of Christ, first of all. But on icons, we don't have the same doctrine on icons. I will even go as far as to say, not only to Orientals, but to Roman Catholics. And what I want to say is that this theology of icons really is only present in the Orthodox Church. I'm not saying icons don't exist in Roman Catholics or in, in, in Copts. I'm not saying they don't have icons, but they do lack a theology of the icon. I, I think they do lack that. But that is something that we have. Like a Roman Catholic might say, but how can we lack that when we accept the same ecumenical council? Well, first of all, I'd be very interested to see any of like Roman Catholic like post-schism saints or any of like apologists. I've never, like there are countless Roman Catholic apologists. They never make these kinds of arguments for icons. They never talk about the seventh council like this. They never, ever. They kind of just stick to the basics and they don't really go much further from that. Or with Orientals, I mean, where are their theology of icons? Where is it? Because uh, I don't see much of it. At most, it's like, oh, it's tradition. Well, okay, but do you have anything more? Uh, right? Essence Energy's distinction in many ways was the foundation for the iconophile position because it is God's defined uncreated grace that makes the icons important and worthy of veneration. And the Seventh Ecumenical Council, at the very least, has implicit commentary on future Western practices. Latin transubstantiation is one of those things. Eucharistic adoration, statuary, uh, all of these have some kind of implicit commentary in the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and uh, that is all I want to cover for this for this video. So um, this will mark the end of I think History of Christian Theology series. Maybe there might be one more video on the Great Schism, maybe. Um, but this will this will be it. Uh, this will be it. So again, thank you all for watching this. I really appreciate you listening to me ramble for seventy seven minutes. Uh, I will see you guys in the next video. God be with you all.